you, Lord. I need you now. Good morning. Welcome to the Bond Sunday Morning Services. Thank you so much for being with me. You can get involved by calling 800-411-2663, 800-411-BOND. You can also email me, church at bondinfo.org, church at bondinfo.org, and put your name and tell, name and tell your emails, and I can respond today as it is happening. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm glad you. I'm glad you came. It's a, uh, I'm glad you came. Thanks for being here. I. Um, oh, any questions for me before I get going? Because I don't. I don't want to get you in the habit of just. I gotta wait and go to church to hear what Jesse has to say. Uh, I have a question. Y- yes, sir. I love that. Um, I know <laughs> you always talk to us about how you want to become uh, more and more aware. Yes. Uh, what motivates you or what inspires you to, to keep one and become more and more aware? Good question. When I look back on it, it seemed as though I've been that way all my life. It, it kind of came with me because I can remember even as a kid wanting to understand more about God. You know, because I was going, I mean, when I popped out of my mother's womb, they sat me in a church. And so I started hearing about God, right? (laughs) And then I started hearing about how we should be as children of God as opposed to those who does not or do not believe in God. And so I started wondering, wow, how can that, that sounds so nice, how can that be? So I started asking questions even as a kid. So I think it just kind of always been with me. And then the more I discover, the more I want to know. And, it's, it, and I noticed that the more I discover, the freer I become. And so I'm thinking that there is a way to live on this earth sin-free with total peace and deal with the challenges of life, but as a son of God, not be, you know, not, you're not controlled by the issues and challenges. I totally believe that there is a, you can live that way. And I realized, I was just thinking about this the other day, I realized I'm overcoming all the dumbing down and brainwashing that has taken place in my life from people who taught me about God. You know, they just taught about uh, Jesus, but they didn't awaken anything in me, and I learned some of that stuff. And it ain't, it's not anything like I thought it was. And so I'm just, like, totally into it. Not, like, freaked out into it, but I just want to know. I just want to know. I hope I can get there before I die how to live that life here on this earth because it is possible. We have it in us to do because I've seen so many things inside of myself from within that I didn't know was there beforehand. I lived all that life and I didn't discover those things until the last 25 years when God woke me up to them. And each day I discover more and more and more. Even about, and I know this is a long answer, <laughs> Even about the be still and no prayer, it's, it's more than just sitting still and watching your thoughts or watching the light. You have to go beyond that. There is, it's, it's more to it than just that. You know, there is a, a still, quiet place within us that is there, but you got to go past the light. Because if folks here, oh, go inside and watch the light, that's all you talk about, the light, right? And they never get past that. Or if they say, go in and watch what you're thinking, how you're feeling, they'll get stuck there. But beyond that is where we really want to be. And that is in that spot of perfect stillness within. And I'm kind of getting there a little bit. And it's something else. And I didn't know that that was there. So every time I discover something, it just makes me want to go further into it. Uh, so that's it. It just came with me. I think I've always been that way. I don't ever, I remember, and I talked about this on the radio show. <clears throat> we used to have what we call revival at our church down in Alabama. And that's every year they have about two weeks of revival, maybe a week of revival, where all the sinners have to gather together and sit on the, what they call the morning bench, morning bench, bench. And people pray for you, preach a preacher over you, and get you saved, right? And uh, 
I remember then thinking, wow, this is so interesting that they're trying to get us saved. You know, and so I was really interested in that. And then the preachers used to say, well, if you really want to know if you believe in God, just ask him to do something for you. He will reveal himself. Just ask him whatever you want and he'll do it. And there are people who would get up and testify to asking God things and they say God did it. <clears throat> and so as a teenager, I remember walking down the road one day. It was a bright, sunshine day. No clouds, no rain, no nothing. And I remember asking God, you know what? And this was during revival time. I was like, if I have prayed enough to save my soul from burning in hell, I was a teenager. And they said, ask this. Let me know by let it rain right now. You know, thunder and rain right now. And right away it did it. It didn't rain on me, it just rained in front of me. And I'm like, wow, that's so cool. He just, it was a bright sunshine of the day and it just happened. And it was so nice that it happened. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I am okay then. And then I remember at the end of the revival service at the end of that week, when they were really winding down and trying to get us all to be saved, I asked them one more time. I, my grandmother would always sing in the church. And she would like sing different songs. And so I remember one, the last night or so of the service, I said, you know what, if, if I'm okay, if this is it, if I've been born again, let, my, let mama sing this particular song. I asked for a special song. And lo and behold, before the meeting was over, she sang that song and I was out done. I was just, I mean, I felt warm in my body. I felt like something happened there. So I just kind of been interested in all my life. And I believe that God is real. I believe he's in us. And I believe we've been missing it because we've been brainwashed. And a lot of people know about him, but they don't really know him. And I didn't know him prior to, to the last 25 years, even though he did those things for me. That was a long answer, huh? Yeah, that was helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And, and are, you, are you interested in him? Uh, you know, it, it comes and goes. I, I noticed, uh, uh, like when I'm here, I really uh, kind of want it. But then <laughs> as you go out into the world, you're faced with all these uh, challenges. And uh, yeah. uh, so you get, I get kind of swept away. By your challenges? By the challenges. You said something uh, last Sunday uh, after the meeting that was kind of helpful. That You said that uh, 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 when you don't have no thoughts, you are, you are aware. Yes. So that was kind of helpful. So I, I've been noticing, like, when I get into my thoughts, uh, and then I just kind of stop, and, and then I don't have any thoughts, then I, I kind of remember what you said, and that, that's been kind of helpful because I always heard, like, you know, you say, like, stay out of your imagination yeah. uh, or stay God in the presence. Bring, God said, bring every imagination into captivity. We should have control over that. Okay. And you also heard you say, uh, you know, stay in the presence. But that was kind of helpful uh, how when you said you don't have, when you don't have any thoughts, you are aware. And so that was, that's been kind of helpful. But I noticed uh, I don't really have the, uh, uh, the motivation that I kind of see in you where, where you uh, always want to be more and more aware. Yeah. I'm kind of, uh, I have uh, all these different projects at work and, and projects when I get off work, so they kind of take over. I understand that. In all honesty, now I think I know, but I don't really understand how anybody can live on this earth and not let seeking him first be the foremost thing in their lives. I, I don't know how you can live like that because evil is definitely taking over and controlling everything. You see it in families now. You see it everywhere around you. I don't know how you can not, and, and I don't want to sound all proudful and all that. I'm just saying, I don't know how you can not want that more than anything else. Because uh, anything less than that or other than that, then you're just suffering through life. 
life is something else, even seeking it and wanting to know, but not to be serious about it. Life is hell. Life is, I heard some stuff this weekend from a family that the whole family just messed up. I mean, just, and they're Christian. Everybody in there is a Christian, but they are absolutely destroyed almost. And so I don't know how you can live on this earth and not want the help from God. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Because it's impossible to do it on our own, especially with the imagination at work in the manner that it is. I had a, I've been counseling with this family and they, uh, they're Christians. They voted for same-sex marriage. And they, who said that? Oh, <laughs> hey man, brother, I love that. <laughs> That's how they used to do it in the good old days. When men were men, boy were boy. Oh, uh, hey man, brother. That's real church. <laughs> and so I would say to them, how can you vote for this if you're a Christian? Well, people have the right to do what they want. It's here anyway. Who am I to judge, right? And so within the last month, the parents of the family found out that one of their adult kids is homosexual now. And they are having a hissy fit about it. They're mad at the person, the person around. They're like, I'm like, why are you mad? You just said it's here, it's fine. But when it hits your home, it's a different thing. They don't like it now that it's in their home. And I'm thinking, wow, these people, these, something wrong with the world. The world is blind and can't see. Another thing I was thinking about is that I heard a report that a lot of black Americans are moving back to the South to Georgia, Alabama, uh, you know, Mississippi and all those places. And, and those areas are pretty conservative. For the most part, they're conservative. Texas and those places. And yet blacks are leaving the inner city, going back to these states that are conservative. And I'm thinking, I don't, blacks are all messed up. Not all, not all, not all. But they live in the inner cities and they vote for people and situations that bring on crime and destruction to the family day in and day out. They vote for those things that they don't like. And when those areas turn into ghettos, they run back to the conservative states where the conservative people tend to be more godly and try to not, you know, they are not for those things. And yet the blacks don't do anything to vote for or make sure their communities and their families are tight. And, I, and I'm thinking maybe they just don't see what they're doing. Because if you really want a conservative, godly, family-oriented area, you're going to vote that way, you're going to live that way, you're going to vote for Christians who are going to make sure those things happen. But they don't do it, and I don't understand it. Other than, I don't know. What do you think about that? I don't know what to think of it. <laughs> But isn't that interesting, though? Yes. It is, huh? Yes. But so do you, do you have a strong desire? And when I say strong, it's not like it's just a, a, a warning desire to, to be like one with God, to really know what that means. Not 100%. Not 100%. Yeah. And how you know you don't have it 100%? Well, just like you were just saying, um, like I was telling you, I have all these projects, and I think I I am accustomed to falling back on relying on myself, oh, okay. or relying on, I guess that voice that lies to you, but right. it you tells fall me, back. oh, oh, you got to start early on this project so this can be finished by this date, and then, <laughs> and so it seemed like I kind of fall back into my mind as far as trying to finish these projects in a in a certain amount of time. You fall back into the imagination because that's where the setup is. I have, a, you know, work to do too and a lot of work to do. And my job is to deal, my primary job is to deal with people. And believe me, you don't want to deal with people every day. People are messed up, absolutely messed up. You can't trust them. They, I don't know, they're just messed up. But yeah, I keep my eyes focused on myself and I learn so much about it. You know, so even if whatever work you're doing, 
if you could be, don't cut your head off or hurt your hand, whatever you're doing, but if you can just kind of practice being now, being here in the presence of God, you'll find that your work will just flow. Everything will just kind of work out. It's easier that way. But if you take your mind off God or yourself from within and go into your imagination, then everything become, a, you know, a problem for you. Um, okay. So if you don't have it, just ask God to give it to you. He will. That desire to know him. All right. Because it's all spiritual. Don't beat yourself up about, about it. Don't compare yourself to me or anyone else. Just ask him to help you. Like the uh, Thomas in the Bible said, doubting Thomas by his unbelief. He recognized his unbelief or something like that, but help me to believe. He'll help you with that too. Yeah. You, you know how you, uh, and I think you used to always say, uh, you have to know yourself. Yes. Uh, I noticed that uh, that voice that talks to, to me in my head, I noticed that um, most of the time that I'm one with it. Yeah, most people are. 99.999.9. But the beauty about it, noticing it, and don't freak out about it, is changing. You won't feel the change, but after a while you realize that you're not so much with the imagination anymore. It will absolutely change just noticing that. All right. But if you say, if you let the imagination tell you, oh, look how much you lost in your imagination. You're not saved. You don't know God. You know, I start lying to you. Now you're mad about it. It just, it destroys everything. Don't believe anything that it's telling you. It's not going to tell you the truth about anything. Not one iota of anything. I was working with a young man who was traumatized while growing up by his parents. His parents just really did him up. And even though he's older, he's still afraid of authority. And the moment you call his name, he goes into like a panic mode. You know, he's, he's automatically thinking that he's in trouble. And... He does it with his boss, he said, or anybody of authority, right? And so the other day I called, I said, come here for a minute. Because <laughs> I wanted him to see how he's being controlled by this trauma. And the moment I said, I didn't say what I wanted. I just said, hey, come here for a minute. And right away, his whole expression started to change. He almost looked retarded. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I said to him, look how you look retarded. And his whole expression changed, and fear came up on him. He thought he was in trouble, and all kind of stuff. And when I finally showed him what I had to show him, he just totally relaxed. I said, you know what, the reason I didn't, I said, why are you acting that way? Well, because you said, come here, and I thought I was in trouble. A grown man, old enough to be my daddy. And I said, <laughs> I said, but see, now you're not in trouble. You know, I just wanted to show you something. So and I've been trying to tell him for a while now, whatever our trauma is, instead of when a challenge comes to bring it up, bring it out, instead of overreacting, kind of be still and watch how you're acting. Watch what you're thinking. Then you can get over it. But don't go with the feeling. Just relax in it, in it, so you can get over it. But, you know, hopefully he'll get it before he die. Because I'm not going to die. That makes sense? Yes. If you can learn to just relax in your pain instead of fighting it or whatever your pain may be, fear or doubt, or you did something wrong, now you're, you're feeling the pain of it. If you can just learn to relax in that pain within yourself, just watch it. Don't try to fix it. Don't want to get rid of it of yourself. You can overcome then you start overcoming it. Be still and know God. But you got to be conscious enough to see yourself, to know yourself, so you can relax when the trouble comes, when the distress comes. That's where your freedom is. That make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. Like if your wife upset you in the morning time or at night, instead of being all mad at her, relax in your anger. Just notice you're feeling this inside of yourself. Relax in it without putting up any fight. Then you shall be free. That makes sense? Yes, thanks. Yeah. And that's thanks. what it means, an example of what it means to know yourself. Knowing yourself is not enough just to see you get angry. Knowing yourself is knowing how to relax in that anger so you can overcome that anger. 
And that's what I think a lot of people missing because they learn these things, intellectually learn even what I'm saying now, and then they try to act them out and they miss the mark. These, these things are spiritual and the only thing I'm doing is like being a witness to it, what is possible. But you can't learn it and do it because God is in control of it. And Satan is in control of your imagination. You are not in control of anything. Jesse. Yes. You know how you say uh, you got to watch the little things? Yes. It seems like there's so many uh, little things to, right. um, that get you in the course of the day that I end up giving into. And then after the fact, I kind of notice, oh, okay, you should have been watching for that. But That's then right. after that, another little thing would come up that you give into. So it seemed like, you know, it's an ongoing battle. Um, You're absolutely right. There are so many little things because most people are learning about this and they're looking for the big thing. They're looking for the major anger that they feel or they're looking for the fear that they feel. They're not watching those little thoughts or little things that are happening where they are giving into it. You know what I'm saying? For the example, can I think of a little one? Can you think of a little one that would seem not that important, but yet it is? Just even like eating. Uh, you're not really hungry, but you see some food in front of you and you just eat it because it's in front of you. <laughs> yeah. And the imagination has told you that you want it. It's not like you have the hunger for it that's telling you to do it. You see the food, it'll tell you that you want it. And if you're not paying attention to that, you will eat the food. Yeah, and I, I see myself doing that over yeah. and over, just little pieces here and there, and I'm not really even hungry, but because you see it and it's out, you're eating it. That's, that's right. Example. That's a good one. And that don't seem so important, but that's crucial. Because if you can see the little thing that you're giving into, it prepares you for the big things that come. But most people are just looking for the big things. Right. Instead of those. If we can, if you could really, really, if we can really, really see ourselves, there will be nothing on earth that will make you judge your fellow man. Because you would see how much you are being controlled. I, I, I'm, I'm seeing how much I'm being controlled. And if I'm being controlled like this, my fellow man must be being controlled. You know, the same thing is happening. So I can't judge them. Because I wouldn't want to be judged with something that has control on my life. Yeah, real good, man. You doing the prayer? Uh, not, I miss, not every day. I mean, I... Oh, man, we'll suffer and die. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we went through all that. <laughs> Why don't you pray? Why isn't that first? Well, I think I, I listen to my mind as far as when I wake up saying, oh, you got to get on work at a certain amount of time <laughs> so you can get this project done. Yeah. And just, just listening. Uh, and you're like, okay. Yeah, See, I'm that's another thing it. you need to watch. That's a little thing you need to be aware of. Uh -huh. It doesn't want you to pray because it doesn't want your ego to die. That spirit that's made a home in you, it doesn't want to die. And it knows that if you commit to God within, it's going to have to leave. And that's why it convinces you not to pray. Uh -huh. okay. Or it tells you, don't, don't hang out at home by yourself. <laughs> You know, go visit someone, call somebody. It doesn't want you to have that quiet time alone. You know, go to the salsa dancing, whatever it is. To you. Some people like salsa dancing. Okay. Because it does not want you to have that quiet time. It's something else having that quiet time alone. It's mind blowing. I have a friend who, every time I go to, to visit him, everything in the house is on. <laughs> in every room. I'm like, don't you ever have some quiet time? Mm -hmm. And I don't know this. But it doesn't want you to have that quiet time. It is something else. The other day I, I got up on like Saturday morning at 10 a.m. because I sleep late. I had nothing on and I instantly became aware of myself. And then like it was just nothing there. And, I like, and so now I'm thinking who I can call call somebody, but I realized this is my fine moment. And then I went to brush my teeth and it said, turn the TV on so you can watch the news or hear the news. And I'm like, no. 
<laughs> because I want to see what's going on with me. I really do. So watch that kind of thing too. Don't okay. make getting up and having your prayer time the most important thing in your life. And everything else will follow. Okay. All right. Let me take here first, and then I saw here, and then here. Going back what you said before, uh, you know, when you were a teenager, yes, uh, <clears throat> you wanted to see if God really existed, so you asked for it to rain. Yes. You know, I never met anybody ever <laughs> that experienced something like that. And uh, but here's the main the main question. It used to be commonplace when I was growing up. I would hear a lot of people really? saying, there. "Yeah." I never met anybody. And just said, I've been away from it in the city so long, I forgot about it. You know, when you're in the city lights, bright lights, city life, you don't tend to think that God will reveal things to you. Yet, here's the, here's the question. You know, I mean, I, I, I know you to some extent. You know, you mentioned in uh, previous times that uh, uh, you somehow got off the track, or I don't yes. know how to say that. You, in other words, you used to smoke weed and stuff like that. You ever smoke weed? Yeah, yeah. you know what? what you smoked weed before? I mean, I'm not, no. I'm, uh, you said that you smoked <laughs> weed before. Have you ever smoked marijuana? No. Oh, but no, I'm, Here. take it back. I tried once. <laughs> oh, you tried it once? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yes, and you I didn't did. like it? No. What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> I know why that, oh, go ahead, finish your question. Uh, but but the, the, the reason I brought it up uh, is uh, even having an experience like this can still, in other words, you could still go astray. Yes. See, that's, that's, what, uh, that's the main point of my question. That's a good question. Even though I was going to church and, and you know, we all have to repent for our sins because we're born in sin and then we must be born again, right? Even though I was having those things happen, I believe that they would without doubting it. But what had not happened is that spiritual born again experience. That had not happened for me until 25 years ago yes. because I didn't even know. I heard about it, but I didn't know that you could literally have a spiritual born again experience. If I, if I can just add something. As I was listening to you, what also came to mind is the original sin. You know, we were, we were actually born with the original sin, and that really is yeah. what caused you actually, or was, I don't know, part of it? I don't know. Yeah, when I, I, don't when know I got into the sexing and smoking and yes. partying it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though I knew about God, I wasn't being guided by the light that I was aware of. I now realize, though, that God has always been with me because I look back on some stuff that I went through and did while growing up. Uh, but, you know, it's amazing. God has protected me through that stuff. Sure. And so I realized that he was already there, but I wasn't conscious of him being there. And so because I hadn't had the born again experience, I was into the drugs and stuff and pouring it up, and yet just calling myself a Christian. Yeah, so in other words, Original sin actually also dies with your nature when you're born again. That spiritual born again experience, yes. So then you start your, to die. Your original sin dies at that time or around whatever. You start to overcome it because now you're seeing things in a different light. See. And so you start, you start to be, you st he's making you perfect by causing you to deal with life in a perfect light manner. And, and if you don't overreact to it, you become perfect in life your spiritual self, the real you. So that's what I'm doing. I'm overcoming now. Yeah, I see. So that's, that in other words, it doesn't, just listening to what you're saying, it doesn't seem like uh, uh, the original sin dies the moment you're born again. It's, it's a matter of, like you said, living differently and overcoming it. That's a good question. It seems as though once you have that born again experience, you're now guided by the light within, and it's, by, it's now taking care of that for you by allowing you to see and overcome. Whereas before, I wasn't conscious enough to be guided by that light. Even though he was with me, I didn't know it. I was more into the sin stuff. But once you wake up, 
once he wake you up with that experience, then you're just on your way. And you realize even more so that you're not in control of anything. So why hate yourself? Why try to make yourself change? Why judge others? Because you're really not in control. You know, because now you have someone fighting on your behalf. But you got to have that spiritual born again experience. Can you talk about what that experience is? I hear you. I see you motioning from the center of your being yeah. you know, up. Can you talk about that as, a, as an experience, please? Um, so I used to go to church a lot here in L.A. And um, I would try to learn the Bible, but I couldn't learn the words. I couldn't remember the words. Um, I tried to do what the preacher said to do and so you could be saved. That didn't work. And I remember asking God, and I was like, I had a whole lot of conflict. My life was just all messed up. Even though if you had seen me, you would not have known my life was messed up. But I had conflict, I was insecure, I had a lot of doubt and fear. I didn't know my purpose in life or anything. And so <clears throat> one day I, I asked God to let me see myself because it says in the Bible to know yourself. And I, I, I don't even know how I knew I couldn't see myself, but I said to him, you know, I can't really see myself. Let me see myself, right? And I just asked the question and went my way. And then one day I'm getting dressed and I had a flash of what I looked like on the inside. I have a guy that asked about it and I was, it was a darkness in my whole being. And not like a night darkness, it was a spiritual darkness. It was like, have you ever had like a dark ghost come into your room? Anybody ever had that? Yes. Yeah, it was that kind of darkness, I think. And it's not like the night darkness when the sun goes down. And I saw my whole being like that. I'm like, wow, that's what I look like. And then after that, I heard a preacher say, uh, when you pray, right after that too, I heard him say, when you pray, just sit still and know God. He said, you don't have to be hooping and hollering and begging. So I went home and I sat still. After work, I sat still because I really want, and I had my janitorial service at this time, I really wanted to know God, but not knowing what was gonna happen. I had no idea what would take place, but I went and did it because I was desperate. And when I sat there right away, he showed me within myself that I had this resentment toward my parents. But he also allowed me to see that it was wrong to resent them, but it had held me back as well. It was holding me back, I couldn't see. And I felt so sad about that. And it was a sadness. It, was, it wasn't like an earthy sadness, like somebody died or you had a fight with your friend or your husband or your wife and you, you, know, you said something to someone and it was all negative and now you wish you hadn't said it, right? Not that kind of sadness. It was a sadness that took over my being for being wrong. And I went through that and then I knew I had to apologize uh, to my mother first and then to my father. And, and once I did that, everything changed. You know, it was like something awakened in me that I never knew was there. And, and, and that something caused all those things to take place that I just explained to you. And so now I'm aware of this place that's inside of me that I had no awareness before. And not in my head, but it just, it's just there, you know, I know it's there now. And I know now when I'm not operating from it, if I get into my imagination, I know right away and I can go back into it. And I'm growing from that place. It's all spiritual and you really can't learn it. It has to happen to you. It has to, you have to discover it. it has to, the interesting thing about it, it's right here, it's right now. It's, right, it's all, it's waiting on us to just calm down and stop trying. But I can't, there are no words to really other than what I just told you. It, it feels like energy at times. It feels like a love that you never had before or never experienced from anybody before. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's everything. Did that help a little bit? Yes, thank you. Your mind can't comprehend it, I'm telling you. That's why it's hard to find words for it. Yes. <clears throat> Well, my mind can't comprehend. You say can't or can't? Cannot comprehend how you can relax in anger. 
How you, that's that sounds point. like the born again experience to me. <laughs> you know, when you're, let's say you're full of embarrassment or anger or envy or, or lust or anxiety, there's some food in front of you and right. you know not to eat it, but yet there's that anxiety that I got to eat it kind yeah. of thing. How do you relax at that moment when you're not relaxed? Take one second and just become aware of what you're feeling. Don't focus on the person. Don't focus on the situation. Just take a moment and look within. Just, you know, just be aware of yourself within. You may be outside. You can't close your eyes. But you could become aware within by being with your eyes open as well. So whatever's happening out here, don't focus on that. Just for a moment, relax within yourself and focus on what you're feeling. Relax in that. And it, don't, it doesn't matter how strong the pain is or whatever, just relax in it. And I'm telling you, the kingdom of heaven will be yours. Yeah, that's, I hear but what you're, you're saying. But your imagination is going to want to keep you focusing on the outside. Oh, I see. Yeah, your imagination yeah. want you to be, want you to focus on the person that's bringing the problem to you or the temptation or the food or whatever. If I can... It try to distract you to focus out there, but you got to omit that and go within. In other words, if I can get rid of the stress outside, then, then I'll be okay, but that's, that's the wrong way to do it because you'll wind up eating the food. Or... Yes, sure will. Yeah, okay. Don't ever, ever, ever focus on the stress from without. You want to focus on what's happening within. And it'll change your world. And you're right. And the only reason that you're not able to handle that, to do that, is because you've already overreacted to the situation. Well, you've yeah, either that's... judged the situation or you've given into it or you judge yourself because you feel so weak to it. Right. You're making these decisions about it and it prevents you from entering into that place. Oh, that's interesting. Um... You know, sometimes I think it's too bad that this stuff is so hidden, huh? <laughs> it's all hidden. <laughs> but once you enter in there, you're no longer hidden from you. You start to discover. Mm. But it doesn't seem almost, doesn't seem fair, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, Here you, you are get, like a nice guy. You, you get want, beat up all the time. I'm sorry? You get, we're, I'm getting beat up all the time. Yeah. By the temptations and by the, you know, the stresses and everything. And uh, it doesn't. What I would recommend, and I'm, I'm finding myself doing it more, you got to pull away from the excitement of the world sometimes. Times you got to learn to spend more time alone. Instead of you know, whenever you're off work, you got to run and visit right. this person, that person. You're looking for excitement here and there. You you know, when you get home, you're watching the TV or listening to music or just carrying on. You got to start sacrificing those things. Because that is of the flesh, and when you're of the flesh like that, that's what your, your reward would be. But if you can start being more of the spirit, then your reward, reward should be of the spirit. You know, just like John mentioned earlier, um, it seems very overwhelming. You know, when you're saying look out for the little things, yes, they're legion. I mean, they yes, are sir. legion upon legion of little you're gonna things. You're going to be surprised at how many, how many little things are controlling you. How much little things are controlling you. Or how many little times you fail in little things. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty that's right. depressing. How much time do you spend alone with no phone, no radio, no TV, no people, no nothing, just you? That is a, um, a loaded question. <laughs> 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 and as I'm asking I you... I resent that question. As I'm asking, one of the reasons that I was able to do what I did growing up, because we didn't have a radio, we didn't have a TV, we didn't have a telephone for a while, you know. Yeah. And so you had to be alone. You spent a lot of time alone. And when you're alone, that's when things take place. That's so true. Um, I see now why the country folks have the advantage. Yes. Yeah. Because nowadays we're all bent over into our phones. We're that's walking right. or or. Whatever. Yeah, it's bad now. Yeah. You can walk down the road now, and people walking down the street like this. Yeah. They're not seeing anything. You could pass automobiles and families are in there together, everybody on their phone. No conversation, no downtime or anything. And that's a major problem. Yeah. Because you're feeding your, your ego, and that's your reward. But you need to spend more 
time alone. All right. With nothing. Ooh. Sounds like a small thing, but it is it's major. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Let's go right here. Yeah. Um, John, I just want to say that Jesse has prayed for things that didn't happen. I once was riding a bike with him, and he didn't have his helmet on. <laughs> he prayed to God that God would take care of him, and he literally fell down like three minutes later. That was uh, so funny. <laughs> we would go hiking and ride a bike because, you know, on a Saturday. And one day he said, look, Jesse, put your helmet on, right? And I'm like, oh, that's all right. The Lord is with me. And as soon as I got on the bike, I fell off into the bushes. <laughs> It happened twice. <laughs> I'm like, what a fool I am. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, New York Times actually had an interesting article on boredom. And I don't know if anybody saw that or not, but they talked about how important it is for kids to experience boredom. And it's all the same things that we're talking about. Yes. Why it's important for all of us yeah. to, to be bored and, and, and be alone and not have any outside distractions or anything like that. So it's kind of kind of interesting. I have uh, some granddaughters, set of twin granddaughters, and they hate being bored. Hate being bored. So they'll say, "Grandpa, I'm bored." And so a while back, I taught them. I said, "Boredom is good." And he's like, "Why is it good?" I said, "Because it helps you to become creative. It brings out the best in you. It connects you with your your father, God." I said, remember that, all right? Always remember that. Okay, I will. And then lately they've been saying they're bored. And before I could give them the answer, they will say, I know we're supposed to be bored because God is with us, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes. But it is, you got to let yourself be bored. If you want to live, allow boredom to overtake you. It really, really does. It's the way to go. And a lot of parents would not allow their kids to be bored nowadays. They'll put them on a phone or in, TV, in front of a TV or some game or something to keep from having to deal with them. And they're killing their consciousness. They're killing their relationship with God. And the, and the kids are becoming just like the parents. Yeah, it seems, too, that society wants you to think that if you're not busy, yes. then something's wrong. Right. And so, you know, you got to got to always be doing something, you know, go see a movie if you have to do this, do that, do this, do that. And it just keeps you going. Yeah. So that you don't become aware. If you want to if you want to really, really hear from Satan, spend time alone. You can just hear him coming up with suggestions and telling you how you are nothing and you're not important and you nobody like you. And you can hear from Satan when you're alone. But that's good because you start to see your connection with him. Don't run from that. Run to that. You got to start spending time alone. Do you, how much time do you spend alone? I'm spending a lot more time alone in the last six months. And uh, it's a lot of your recommendation, quite frankly. And that's helped a lot. Um, and, and, and what is it like being alone? How does it help? I think it's, you just start seeing more about yourself. Yeah. Um, you're more settled. Not, not, you're not trying to be. You just, there's just less going on, so you can just kind of touch base again. It's something else how you could be around people and have a false sense of being important. <laughs> you could be at a party. You could be eating meal, eating a meal, and feel like you're something. And the moment those things have been taken away from you, you realize you're nothing. That's interesting how the outside world can keep you from that inner world like that. And people die for that. And then if they're all alone and they're feeling this, this pain, you know what they do? They go to the doctor and get a boredom pill. And they start saying, I'm depressed. Um, uh, uh -huh, anxiety. ADD. When, yeah. And so the doctor gave them a pill. So I tell them, look, don't name it. When you're alone and you're feeling this stuff, just watch it. Don't call it boredom. Don't call it a <coughs> DDI. Don't call it ADD. Just watch it and take it because it's a spiritual thing happening. And a pill is only going to keep you away from it. The doctor doesn't understand what they're doing, I think. Yeah, one of the things, and, and to John talking about the little things, 
you know, I, I didn't meditate one night this week. And it's amazing how big that was. Yeah. Even even one little thing where you let go of something and then all of a sudden you feel your defenses are down. It's, it's, it's amazing. I have to pray. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, how late it is, how early it is. It was prayer that slowed me down so God can take hold of my life. I can't imagine not praying. I really can't imagine not doing it. It's like it would be a dis... And I may be wrong, but it looked like it would be a disconnection away from my Heavenly Father within not to pray. I can't imagine not doing it. Who don't pray morning and night? Wow. That's, all these people. <laughs> Why not? Come here uh, with the mic. Uh-huh. <laughs> right here, John. Yeah, yeah, the young lady. Why not? Why don't you pray? Um, I pray every night, every night, but not in the morning. And your greatest challenge is during the day. Yeah, no, during and, the day. And why not? Why not? Um, sometimes I do. Sometimes when I have time, I do. When you have time. <laughs> yeah. God, God has given us a, an order. I don't know if it's a, a commandment or not. To pray without ceasing. He wants you to always be in a state of prayer. Isn't that something he'd tell us to do that? And he wasn't joking around. You know, he didn't give us this for, oh, I have no, no other pressure to put on. Let me come up with something. Oh, I know what. I have them pray night and day. Stay with it. It's a serious thing because the battle is spiritual. And so I'm saying do it morning and night in hope that if you do it, then it'll be constant. It'll be all day long. You'll be in that frame of mind. You'll be in the moment where God is. And so just suffer some more. Let the world beat you up until you get tired. That makes sense, right? I can't hear you. Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you, you don't I'm, either, right? And right here, John. Oh. Why don't you pray? Well, I pray every morning. However, I, I, night times I usually fall asleep. Like you say, you should do it before you sit down to rest. But yeah. then I, I just fall asleep. Wow. Even if I think about it, if I sit down there, I just fall asleep. So your relationship with the Creator is not that important to you? It is important to me, and I, I, mean, I, I feel blessed. I feel that I'm connected. I, if, I don't, if I don't pray every day, then, yeah, I start freaking out, like there's something wrong. Yeah, and but don't I freak to, out, though. Well, I don't, but I mean, I can feel the... Yeah. The real anxiety, pressure, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yes, then I have to commit myself to pray, but I j just don't. What I happens is when do you don't day. do it, Satan get busy with you and say, oh, you didn't pray today. You know, life going to be hell for you. You're not saved. You can't get back to it. He'll start lying to you, and you'll start believing it. Yeah. Well, I, well, I don't. It was like what we used to do, and I still hear people do it. They go to church on Sunday so they can be all puffed up for the rest of the week. And by the time they, they by the time Saturday rolls around, they're all wiped out. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, I gotta go to church tomorrow so I can get built up for the week. We should live a life like that, always built up in the Father. Well, well, I mean, I, I you know, I, I did go to New York to visit my daughter. Oh, how did that go? Very good. She treated you well? Yes. I, I mean, I called her and I talked to her and I said, you know, I'm not coming there because, you know, you, the way you guys treat me, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, she said, oh, mom, it's just you. You know, you just want to be the center of attention and on and on. She said, you just want attention? Yeah, she said, I want to be the center <laughs> of attention. So I said, well, uh, I still didn't appreciate the way you treated me. Yeah. And yeah, I would like some attention. <laughs> 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 That's right. Be so, honest. So anyway, she's so when I went, they were very nice to me, and uh, she didn't insist that I put my purse in any particular place. You know, I was mindful, and I, you know, uh, stayed in control of myself. And I, she didn't I, make you put your purse purse in certain places, and don't yeah, leave yeah. In other words, oh, she, she left me. Uh, her alone. daughter. She would go visit her daughter, 
and her daughter, according to what she, Mary is saying, was so mean to her, if she were to set her purse down somewhere in her house, the daughter would yell at her about the purse. Yeah, so she, she, was much, <laughs> she was much better, so I was so, so then that made me more mindful, and I, um, you know, so we had a good time, and we talked, and good. we, you know, and, and yes, I, I noticed that the little pits like she has at me, they're mainly from the little pits I had at her. Yes, ma'am. So, so, you know, back. so I, I, um, I was able to just, <laughs> step, you know, sit back and relax, and she would want me to come because she said, your grandson is waiting for you. You, you promised you were coming. Oh, good. So my grandson, you know, he loves his grandma, so he, we had a good time, and, you know, it was, was really good. I'm glad I went. Great. I have a granddaughter that I did not, was not around while she was growing up. And so she heard all these things about me, about I hate women, I hate the gays, I hate the blacks, I hate this. And so she was hanging around my other family members and they were putting all this stuff in her head. And now she's older, she's uh, 20 years old now, she wanted to be my friend. And so finally I said to her, we're not gonna be friends because you don't like me. I hear all these things you're saying about me, so you don't like me, right? And to my surprise, she called up and said, Grandpa, I, I do like you. I, I want to get to know you. I want to be with you. I'm, you know, I just thought these things because that's what I heard, and I, and I didn't agree with them. But I do want to be friends. And I make that point because if you could be honest with your daughter in the manner that you are, you, you, there's a chance of getting these things worked out. Yeah, yeah so, because I didn't want to be around her. Yeah. Now, now I don't mind. So it was much better. <laughs> Even my, my son Austin, yeah. you know, I always find some kind of little dick, but he was very nice. So I anything to him. <laughs> she like, my grandson, you know, he just loves his grandma, so, that, so that's why I yeah. really like uh, to go because he, we talked about God and he talked about, you know, he's very... Um, well, I'm so happy to hear very this. Good, yeah. I'm so, glad you worked it out with your daughter. Yeah, me too. Now you don't I, feel like a stepchild when you go over there. Right. No, <laughs> you, know, so, you know, so that was good. Right on. Right. Um, you know, I want to read something to you real fast here about how come you don't pray, Armors? Go to Armors, Bob. I'm surprised. All oh, that anger you got up in you. <laughs> I'm just not committed to it. Wow. So stop pretending that you are there. What do you mean? Like, if, if you guys are not going to truly be serious about this, in that you're going to seek the kingdom, you're going to, you know, you want to really overcome this thing that's made a home inside of you, don't even pretend. Just go be an angry person. Be an unhappy. Come pretending is holding you back, too. I mean, how am I pretending? You asked. I raised my hand and said I'm not committed. Now, I'm not just talking about you. Uh, I'm talking about anyone who is not really ready to go all the way with this. Because you're so, only delaying. So we should just go on the other extreme and <laughs> even though you know that's no, not the not way to that. be. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean. You should do something. <laughs> because pretending is not getting you to where you want to be in life. You know what I mean? Do you feel well, I don't like when you said like pretending? I mean, it's. I mean, for me, I guess I don't. Uh, obviously, since I'm not committed to it, I think I don't fully see the value of the prayer. Yes. That's why I'm not committed to it. But I know there's some value to it. I don't. I mean, I don't understand the depths of it, so therefore, I'm not really committed to it. But it's still better than not not, not doing being anything. halfway committed. Yeah. Okay. All right. God said, either you want hot or you're cold. You know, pretending is cold. Either you want this or you don't want it. Either you're going to accept salvation here and now, or you're not going to accept it. But Satan have you thinking, well, at least I'm doing something. <laughs> <laughs> this is holding me over, you know. I don't know if I would play that game or not. I think you're being deceived. Yes, real fast. Um, but, um, Rhonda, come and read something for me, please. It's an exercise. I mean, it's just like an exercise of our body and our everything. It's an exercise of our wanting to see where, where we should where we should be in, it's a in the universe, thing, yeah. in a spiritual you way, wanna, as opposed to a physical way for the uh, external. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, so is it okay to meditate like nine o'clock and don't go to bed till 11 or do you have to do it immediately? I wouldn't wait until, you know how your body shut down every certain time, you know, at 10 o'clock your body just out yeah, of it. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't wait until that moment. You can do it. Nine o'clock. But that's what I'm saying. I can yeah. do it in advance and then still do a few things before going to bed. Yes. I don't immediately have to go to bed. No. Oh, okay. Because oh, you're under the impression that you need to pray and then get right into bed. Right. No. No. Uh-uh. Okay, that's fine. Cause that's no. why Anybody else think that way too? Because <laughs> that's what I used to. Come on, Ron. Yeah, you think so... that way? You need to pray and then jump right in bed. No. Yes. So Okay, so that's fine. Don't no, that's that. not how Don't you... have to. No. Okay. Then that makes it. That makes it easier yeah. because then you can set a time and then just do it. <laughs> I want to just read this to you about, no, you don't have to wait until it's time to close your eyes and go to bed. I want to read something to you about distress, worldly stress and godly stress. This is in uh, Second Corinthians. We're going to start at uh, chapter 7, 5 through through 12. So start here for me, right now. Right? This is where Paul went to. Did I read this last week? Macedonia? No. Donia? And uh, he joined with Titus there. Even after we had come to Macedonia, there was no rest for the body of ours. Far from it. We were beset by hardship on all sides. There were quarrels all around us and misgivings within us. But God, who encourages all those who are distressed, encouraged us through the arrival of Titus. And not simply by his arrival only, but also by means of the encouragement that you had given him. As he told us of your desire to see us, how sorry you were and how concerned for us so that I was all the more joyful. So now, though I did distress you with my letter, I do not regret it. Even if I did regret it, and I realize that this letter distressed you, even though not for long, I am glad now, not because you were made to feel distress, but because the distress that you were caused led to repentance. Your distress was the kind that God approves, and so you have come to no kind of harm through us, but to be distressed in a way that God approves, leads to repentance, and then to salvation with no regrets. It is the world's kind of distress that ends in death. Just look at this present case, at what the result has been of your being made to feel distress in the way that God approves. What concern, what defiance, what defense, what indignation, and what alarm, what yearning, and what enthusiasm, and what justice done. In every way, you have cleared yourselves of blame in this matter. So although I wrote a letter to you, it is not for the sake of the offender, nor for the one offended, but only so that you yourself should fully realize in the sight of God what concern you have for us. That is where I have found encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. When I said to you, there, there are two ways of repentance. When I said to you, when you have this pain of anger or fear or doubt and your, your body is hurting and aching from it or you... You're worried about what someone thinks about you. Instead of uh, going outwardly and trying to solve the problem, let you feel the stress within. Relax in it. And feel that distress of what your mind is telling you about it. And that will cause you to repent. Or if someone is cruel to you, but they're telling you, even if they're not cruel, but they're telling you the absolute truth about yourself, you know how you want to run away from that too? Relax in that. That kind of stress is good. That will set you free. But when you run away from it, it's worldly stress, and you end up killing yourself. We just had a football player who had a fight with his girlfriend or something, and he killed her and then went and killed himself, right? That's worldly stress. But if the guy had just relaxed in whatever that was going on, I think they said they were arguing or something, he he shot his child too, I believe. But they said something like she had a baby and he, the baby's still alive. okay. But it's that worldly stress that will destroy you. But if you can relax within and then feel the stress or the pain of being wrong or, or judging, whatever it is, you can repent. The righteous kind of repentance will take place on its own. So you're harming yourself by running away from that. You do yourself good by going toward that. Will, will you remember that? Because you're going to get it as soon as the meeting is over. (laughs) 
But just instead of quickly overreacting, just take one little moment and relax in it. Just let your body feel it. And God is with you. You shall be fine. All right? So practice that for the week. And don't forget to pray because you got to let the anger go. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for coming. I appreciate it. For more information, to purchase a copy of this program or to make a donation, visit us on the web at bondinfo.org or call 1-800-411-2663. That's 1-800-411-BOND. You're already home.